an original MCM production. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our program, and I don't usually get to do the introductions, but I do get to introduce Julia Taylor. Julia is a woman who needs little introduction to everybody here because sitting near her at the table today, everybody came up and had to talk to her, so she barely got any lunch in. Um, she was appointed the first woman president of the Greater Milwaukee Committee in December 22. GMC membership is comprised of 200 CEOs and leaders in various sectors of Milwaukee, including business, labor, academic, philanthropy, and nonprofit. The GMC convenes and collaborates with other organizations and groups in our community on an issue-by-issue -issue basis and leads by initiating projects and initiating strategies. Before the GMC, Julia was president of the YWCA of Greater Milwaukee for 16 years and managed a $40 million annual budget there. During her tenure at the YWCA, she led initiatives resulting in national models for employment training and placement, affordable housing, women's leadership, and racial justice. Julia has served on the boards of Aurora Healthcare, Big Brothers Big Sisters, the Governor's Glass Ceiling Commission, the Governor's Workforce Investment Board, the National Association of YW, YWCA Executives, and was co-chair of UPAF's 2009 campaign. She currently serves on the boards of UPAF, the Water Council, the University Club of Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Film Festival, and probably some others too that aren't listed here. Julia will be talking about creative placemaking in general and the GMC committee's creative placemaking efforts here in Milwaukee. This will then be followed by a panel discussion with Daryl Johnson and Tim McCallow. With that, welcome Julia. It's always great to be here because I get to see so many people that uh, I know and I uh, don't often get to see over the years. As a matter of fact, uh, one person that's here is Jude Wera, and Jude, I don't know if he often claims this, but he's the guy who brought me to Milwaukee. So hopefully it was a, it was a good thing for you, Jude. <laughs> so it's been good for me. I know that over the years. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit today about uh, creative placemaking and how also creative placemaking connects to some other big projects. Um, in November, the GMC and the mayor presented to our membership a process for developing a downtown plan. But we also talked about developing the surrounding neighborhoods because the neighborhoods have to flourish as well as the downtown does. And I uh, really admire Rip Rapson, who is the head of the Kresge Foundation that's played such a leadership role in the revival of Detroit. And uh, about a year ago, he wrote a white paper where he spoke about uh, the importance of the work that Kresge's done in both the downtown and the neighborhood. And he said, we at Kresge accordingly decided in Detroit that the first order of business was to help create a civic framework that would equip us to make balanced decisions affecting every part of the city. It's a mistake to draw bright line distinctions between downtowns and neighborhoods. But that's exactly what has emerged over the last six years in Detroit as the downtown began its transformation while neighborhoods slipped into even deeper decline. We found ourselves too frequently trapped in a polarizing narrative. The corrosive po poverty, the disinvestment, the blight of the neighborhood landscape measured against the substantial real estate, commercial, transit, and recreational investments in the business district and the Woodward Corridor. So does this sound familiar in terms of some of the discussions that are going on in Milwaukee? I think it does, and uh, we want to make sure that we can address that, and we think creative pl uh, placemaking is an important field of work to address that. So the good news is, is that with our creative placemaking work, we're already working in many neighborhoods surrounding the downtown. And 
why is creative placemaking important and what's the impact of placemaking on neighborhood development? Uh, Art Place America actually, I think, has done probably what I've seen the best job of defining what the process of creative placemaking is. Basically, uh, you identify a place-based issue, you engage those who work and live there in the changes that they'd like to see, you use the arts and creative efforts to achieve the change, and then you document the change. So for me, the strengths of creative placemaking are that you get active neighborhood engagement and input on key decisions that are affecting all the residents. You have strong partnerships with community development agencies like Riverworks, the city, community and business leaders and artists. And those partnerships can really accelerate projects that have sometimes just sat, sat on a dime for a long time. Uh, projects like housing, creative enterprises, new public spaces, resource centers. You can also start to rebuild a new brand in a neighborhood that's authentic based on existing assets. And lastly, you can create a civic framework of neighborhood and institutional leadership, investors, business owners, and emerging uh, creative leadership that together they come to the table, they set the local strategies and goals for their community, and they align the resources to accomplish those goals. So <clears throat> just to give you an example, I don't know how many of you recognize this place, West Wisconsin Avenue. It had a lot of perception problems over the years as unsafe, nothing was happening, you wouldn't go there at night, there was no retail really happening. So take a look now. That was the night market by Newaukee, and I know Ian's here, so Ian, thank you for your hard work on that. Um, <clears throat> With the help of an Art Place America grant, in 2014 we partnered with the city of Milwaukee to create the first night markets. Uh, it's a place-based solution to a big perception problem using art and creative enterprises. It's really getting people to reimagine the avenue, to come down, to see themselves down there. It's helping retailers reimagine the, neighbor, the area. There have been, since this whole thing started, there have been 300 new units of housing that have gone on in West Wisconsin Avenue. So it created that civic framework for this dialogue to happen. And as I like to say, mum's the word. So in 2014, with that same Art Place America grant, we began working with Riverworks, a community group called Be and Tween, and a consultant uh, named Sarah Delayden, who go, is, uh, her company's name is M-K-E-L-E-X, because she spends half her time in Los Angeles and half her time in Milwaukee. Uh, and we really were focused on an abandoned railway that's in the heart of the Rambe and River West area and how to connect to different neighborhoods. This is what it looked like <clears throat> when we started the summer of activities to really bring both communities together with fun, arts, and, and also gain their feedback on what they wanted to see happen on the trail and ultimately it kind of spilled over into what they wanted to see happen in the neighborhood. And in 2015, we were able to amp up our efforts with a, a major grant for the Kresge Foundation in the Riverworks area. So why are we focused on this area? There is a street called Holton Street. Many of you are probably familiar with it. And there's a phenomenon known as the Holton Street Divide. If you look at Holton Street, <clears throat> the blue is actually the uh, east side, which is uh, uh, ri uh, River West. The left is Harambe. The blue, or I should say the red is Harambe. And if you look at that, you could see the difference in the neighborhoods. Uh, Harambe is 50% poverty compared to 22% uh, within uh, uh, River West. You've got 72% employment within River West, 39% within Harambe. Self-employment, this is a bright sign for us. This is the uh, income level for self-employment. It rose 148% in River West, but it also rose 92% in Harambe, which shows us some things that we're seeing on the ground with these micro-creative enterprises that are filling up these old commercial buildings and factories that were there. The income level is substantially different. 25,000, which is actually a pretty low level anyway for Milwaukee, 24,000 is considered poverty. But look at Harambe, $9,500. And it's also a young neighborhood, it's a very dense neighborhood, so you can really see the impact that poverty has. And finally, the big thing is market value. Uh, on the right side of the street, uh, you get, the houses go for about 150,000. On the left side, the same house drops almost 100,000 in value. It goes for 34,000. And when you think about a house being a wealth creator for families, for many people, the equity in the home 
is the biggest wealth they have. If you can't even get a mortgage over 34,000, how do you build up that type of wealth? And these are not dissimilar homes. These are very similar housing stock on both sides of Holton. So this is an area that's really attracted us to say, can we make a difference here using creative placemaking and looking at neighborhood development? But I want you to hear some real life examples in terms of what are some of the core strategies that have happened. So I've asked uh, Daryl Johnson from Riverworks to join us as well as Tim McCullough from the city of Milwaukee uh, who's with the Office of Sustainability and runs an, an initiative called Homegrown that he'll tell you about. Um, that actually, uh, not to steal your, fun your thunder, but it won an Eco Innovation Award at South by Southwest this past year and was a pretty big deal for Milwaukee. You may not have read about it anywhere, but you're gonna hear about it today. Uh, Daryl Johnson's been with Riverworks for 10 years. Uh, he runs an exemplary agency. It's been a real privilege to work with him over the last two years. Uh, I'm always amazed at everything he gets done with a very small staff, and it's done extremely well. And he has a huge impact on that community. So I'm gonna ask uh, Daryl and Tim to each come up and just talk about what are your core strategies and how's creative placemaking impacted it? So Daryl? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's always a joy to follow behind Julie because she has a lot of information to share and she always gives me praise on what I do within the neighborhood. And for me, it's a challenge um, because there's many barriers that we deal with every day within these neighborhoods. But it's all about alignment and partnerships. And our work is done because of the partnerships that we create within our neighborhoods between the residents and the, and the businesses. But let me give you a little history of the neighborhood because maybe some of y'all are very familiar. I'm not sure how many in here at one point in time drove American motor car, a pacer, a gremlin. Oh, it was probably all before y'all time. <laughs> but that was the area, if you think about East Capitol Drive, American Motor employed over 3,000 individuals within that neighborhood and within the city of Milwaukee. And when they closed their doors in the 1980s, there was about 38 acres of land, barren land. And so it was one of the challenges of our organization is, was to dispose of that land in a very um, discreet way by bringing jobs back to the area. So one of the things we really started focusing on is the small manufacturers, um, new f um, businesses coming to the area. And we were very successful at that piece of it. But one of the things we found around was the neighborhood surrounding the district, the bid district, was falling apart. Uh, mostly uh, the incidents and problems that was caused within the neighborhood was coming from the Harumbe area. Uh, River West neighborhood has been a very stable neighborhood. Uh, it's integrated, but the Harumbe neighborhood was like 95% African American living in that neighborhood. So as we started moving forward, we started looking at creative ways on how we started looking at opportunities within the neighborhood. So we brought about 64 individual stakeholders within the community to, to what we call strategic action session. And we, what we kind of focused on some of the issues that was happening in these two neighbors and how we could actually build off of some of the assets. So one of the things we did is we did an asset map. We looked at all the institutions, churches, who really have been in this neighborhood for a very long time. And so what we started to do is, how, how do we make this alignment between the residents and the businesses create opportunities? Because one of the things as I was listening to Julia talk, I said, wow, I live in this neighborhood, I work in this neighborhood, but there's so many great opportunities that you find in, this, in these two neighborhoods that we can build off of. These are the things, you know, the, we kind of build off is really branding ourselves as a creative district. Um, when you look at the, a lot of buildings that have been subdivided, um, a lot of in, uh, investment, um, a lot of names of the buildings have changed. Uh, we have a toy factory, we have the nut factory, we have the milk plant, and these are buildings that have been subdivided for a number of businesses to come into. Um, also, we have the Linear Park Trail. I mean, one of the things we've really been focusing on as we build uh, relationships within these communities, um, we have this dividing line, which is Holden Street, between these two neighborhoods. How do we make use of this abandoned railway that can really bridge these two neighborhoods, bring the youth together, bring older adults together, and start thinking about how do we integrate some of these things that make Milwaukee good into on a neighborhood level? Uh, the housing stock 
and both neighborhoods are very similar, but you saw the difference in the market value of these two properties. But one of the biggest things we have to work on is being able to tell our story to an audience so they clearly understand that this is a neighborhood that's on the rise. There's opportunities for the residents and the businesses to survive and do well. And like I've talked about, you know, we had Riverworks Week, and it's really about branding, and it's really about um, bringing people from outside the neighborhood into the neighborhood so they get a clear understanding. So we held a number of events um, throughout the whole week to really engage uh, entrepreneurs, residents, and businesses. Uh, we had what we call the dolphin pool, um, which is a lot different from the shark tank that you see on TV. We were, are more passionate and more concerned about helping small businesses succeed rather than saying no. We're trying to find ways to say yes so they, we can open up some of these other buildings we have for opportunities for these small businesses. And we have many um, partners within our relationships. Um, Wisconsin Women Business Initiative is one of our key partners. They provide the services that we don't provide as an agency, the lending, um, the business support. Um, to help those small businesses move forward. When we started off about five years ago, there was two portions of this trail. One part was within the River West area, and it was subdivided by the city grid, so it was broken up. Um, so we got that piece done. Then the, the second piece came available just recently, and we completed the path that really takes you from Ridge Street to Capitol Drive or to the limits, city limits, which is Glendale. And during the summer, like I said, we had different performance and then activities uh, within the first year. Now we have the path laid, and we're looking forward to this, this summer um, to have more activities along the trail to bridge the, the gap within the two neighborhoods. One of the bigger projects that the um, agency is taking on, the um, Coles Food Store, everybody remember the arches um, throughout the city of Milwaukee. This was one that couldn't be salvaged. Um, I always called it, it was my indoor swimming pool because the basement was always flooded. <laughs> so we undertook this, we tore it down, and we're going to have a new development coming up. And one of the things that's allowing the agency to do is expand our financial opportunity center. We provide financial literacy to individuals. And most of us can go out and hire a, a wealth planner to help us plan and how to. Um, to invest in the future. A lot of these individuals don't have that opportunity. So as an agency, we're providing that wealth building mechanism for these individuals. Well, in this past year, almost two years ago, we had the groundbreaking of the extension of the trail. And one of the great things I can say about the mayor, he gets it, he understands it, understands it and wanna be involved with it. We was at a luncheon um, at the GMC yesterday, and we had our major funder in from the Kresge Foundation. And she is very pleased with the connection we have with the city of Milwaukee, with our Department of City Development, the mayor's office, and all the city departments. So it's not an agency going in by itself to make things happen in, in this community. It's a network of people who are very much interested in making things happen. And one of the things that we have done along the trail, we started in installing art um, as a big piece and really hiring local artists to get involved. And as an individual who's been in this business almost 30 years doing community development, I never thought about using art and culture as a mechanism to really bring neighborhood residents together or as an opportunity to do development within this community. So we have done things, but really capturing those in one, um, bucket and making sure that all these things are connected. Um, how you can move from developing artists into art, artists in housing, how you can take artwork to really change the impact and the visual, visibility of what you see in these neighborhoods. So rather than coming through and seeing vacant border properties, you can see artwork and people who really care about the neighborhood. And one of the things that we have done is we want to look locally what's done, but we also want to look outside of Milwaukee. So we had a number of discovery trips. One was to Chicago. Uh, Theaster Gates, a uh, well-known artist who has made investments back into the Chicago area, um, we went and visited his site. He took this old bank building. Now it's, uh, he created a relationship with um, Johnson Publishing Company, and you see the tons of books uh, within that area. And also we had a chance while I was in Chicago to go see 606, 
um, which was a, a railway that ran through about six different neighborhoods. Uh, all these neighborhoods are different. But what they were able to do is really bridge the differences. And as you travel through these neighborhoods, you see different artwork. You see different um, things that really tell the story of those neighborhoods. We also took a trip to Cleveland. Because uh, one of the things was interesting in Cleveland, um, when we talked about housing disparities, uh, market values, number of vacant aboard up properties, when Milwaukee said, well, we have seven thousand, well, 700 vacant properties, and you go to Cleveland, and they're talking about, well, we have 9,000, 10,000 vacant border properties. It's significantly different. So Milwaukee has a lot going for itself. Uh, one of the things we want to really look at there is how they're making these lot of these units affordable in these neighborhoods. Um, so we had an opportunity to tour this one building, and maybe what they have done in some of their buildings, they have eliminated space, unused space, um, say, for example, if you're in a duplex, what you do is you build a balcony. You don't use a whole floor. So maybe it could be a space for artists to live and work. So we're looking at creating model projects that will work in a lot of these different neighborhoods. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tim McCullough, uh, City of Milwaukee, and I um, want to tell you a little bit about Homegrown and the work that we have been doing um, independently um, of the work, well, independently and jointly with what Riverworks has been doing and what Julie has been doing. Um, but Homegrown was created by Mayor Barrett in 2014 as one of his responses to really the foreclosure crisis, the public health, joblessness issues that are really focused in Milwaukee on the north side of town. So Homegrown has been primarily to date a north side initiative, um, really kind of Highland to Capitol and um, River West out to say 50th Street really. Very simply what Homegrown does is we take, we convert city owned vacant lots of which we own about 2,000 and we convert those into beautiful, healthy, green arts and culture spaces for the communities. That's what we do. And we try to include healthy food in each of these sites as well. And every site that we build um, through public-private partnerships, um, honestly, very little uh, city tax levy money goes into the homegrown project. These public-private partnerships, including uh, several of the folks in this room right now, um, are driving forward and we're creating the new green spaces that are being built by the residents, um, also designed by the residents. We bring in uh, UWM architecture grad students and they, we have, hold workshops. And so these are resident driven with community engagement from day one. And we're going around and trying to create catalytic projects in some of our most challenged neighborhoods you know, there's a number of issues facing the north side of Milwaukee, and a lot of those have long-term solutions. Uh, one of the issues that we're dealing with right now is the issue of vacancy with the boarded up houses and the vacant lots. Vacancy is something we can deal with right now. Um, and, we, and that's exactly what we're doing. And pretty simply and shortly, I, I wanna show you uh, some of the sites that we've been doing across the city. Uh, in the two years we've been together as homegrown, um, with a lot of mayor support, we've created 21 parks, one urban farm, and have helped expand five community gardens in the last two years. <clears throat> what you see here is Ezekiel Gillespie Park, which was finished in 2014. Um, I would argue in July, Gillespie Park is one of the prettiest places in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, we finished it in August 2014. It was formerly two vacant lots and a foreclosed home that was torn down. And with a lot of help um, through partnerships, including uh, great help from Zilber Foundation. Thank you, Susan. Um, we were able to create this park along with Walnut Way and a number of other groups. Um, this park serves from a placemaking perspective um, we've had voter rallies here. We've had neighborhood block parties. Uh, we started an exercise classes. 
And really, that's just the start of it. Um, when we talk about the term placemaking, uh, one of the takeaways, what Homegrown's been doing has been making places the last two years, and then we're starting to really activate them right now. Um, and Gillespie won the 2015 um, Lisk Mandy Award for the best public space, which we're very proud of because there's kind of really only one of those type awards in this city, and this site won that last year. This site also serves as a plant nursery for um, really all the other parks we're doing in the city. Um, it has flood control on it, as well as fruit orchards and, bear and berry plants. Uh, so this is an aerial. This is an actual block party that took place in June. In the upper left, you can see uh, the before picture with the vacant lot in the background. And this site, um, we think, is one of the prettiest sites now in Milwaukee. And the residents love it. Um, I would get uh, phone calls a couple times a week that a bench was out of place or a rock has fallen off a wall. It was really designed for the elders in the neighborhood. One of the major points I'd like to get across is it's the homeowning elders on the north side that are really the bedrock and the cornerstones of, of these neighborhoods. And this park was really designed um, to honor those elders. And it's not designed as a dog park. Uh, we have not been doing any playgrounds to date. Um, we're trying to kind of touching a slightly different market. Um, this is also the mayor's favorite park that we've done to date. And um, the benches we put in there, even uh, from a sustainable perspective, came out of an old, uh, they're actually made out of old bowling lanes from a bowling alley that was formerly on North Avenue. What I'd like to turn to briefly is what we did in 2015, which um, was a high impact year. Uh, we got a grant that's called the Partners for Places Grant and that required a local match. And that local match came from Greater Milwaukee Foundation, Zilber Family Foundation, NML Foundation, and Fund for Lake Michigan. It had a national match from the Bloomberg Philanthropies. And that allowed us to do 20 sites in 2015. Um, and when you think about the length of the growing season and planting season, that was really a push. Uh, this was very much ground up. Uh, we did 20 sites. Each site had a sponsor who serves as the eyes and ears on it, a local neighborhood agency or a nonprofit. We had 12 operating partners, including uh, Growing Power, Stark Nursery, David J. Frank Landscaping, did a wonderful give back to the community on this project. Uh, we planted 230 uh, fruit trees, uh, primarily apples and plums across the city. And the best news, I think, is through the, at Gillespie Park, um, our motto is by the neighborhood for the neighborhood. And so residents are hired from that neighborhood and are given workforce development and training on everything from landscaping to what we call green infrastructure. In 2014, we hired two African-American young men as part of this project. In 20, with these 20 sites in 2015, we were able to go up to 16 young African-American young, young adults, um, frankly, many who had records. And that's part of the jobs and economic development story that just comes about as you're doing creative placemaking. Uh, before I show you some of our new sites, I just want to say, I've had people come up to me and say, Tim, really, with all the issues on the north side, you're planting apple trees, really? That's, that's our response? And, and I welcome that question because it's not about the apple trees. What research shows when you activate and create a green space in neighborhoods like this, you get a number of benefits. Property values around that green space start to rise. In Washington, D.C., property values jumped as much as 30%. Crime stabilizes and falls. Um, litter becomes less of an issue. Um, we're increasing unemployment by hiring area residents, and frankly, the city costs drop as well. So it's not, not only do we get a great space where we can put on cultural events, a number of our sites have public art, we're getting all these ancillary socioeconomic benefits just from that one green space. 
So in terms of what we did this year, uh, I'm not going to show you 20 slideshows, just that here's a sample. Uh, 14th and North with Walnut Way, we built Sunshine Park. Um, this is kind of fun because as you're driving down North Avenue, you don't expect to see a park, especially with boulders. Um, this is a uh, Catalyst development, which is designed to help spur on what's been going on on North Avenue, especially in this neighborhood with Outpost opening a branch and future expansion that's being done by Walnut Way in the neighborhood. Ezekiel Gillespie Park is two blocks away. Uh, we like to do clusters. Uh, um, it's an important concept of Riverworks and it's an important cluster of ours. Uh, we actually built two sites um, with Riverworks um, this summer as well. Metcalf Park, uh, this is the one that usually gets the oohs and ahs. This is at 38th and Clark in Metcalf Park. Um, this is across the street from MLK College Prep and from a placemaking perspective, um, you don't see the benches and things in a lot of these, they do exist. They're just not in these particular sets of pictures. This site is designed for parents and kids before school and after school to hang out. Um, and for parents to mingle waiting for their kids to come out the door across the street. And that is really um, the, its main purpose from a placemaking perspective. And you can imagine these sites too. Uh, a lot of these sites were finished in October, November. When they're, just imagine how they're gonna look planted up in the spring. Um, Dr. Carter Park is at 24th and Burley. This park was also built this summer um, in conjunction with Amani United. It's about a block away from the big COA office over there. Um, again, cost, doing neighborhood clustering. And it's near another site on 22nd and Orchard. Uh, what's wonderful about this site is, as we developed the project, uh, the Brico Fund also came in and wanted to do major public art installations um, on two of the sites. And th this site will have a major public art installation in 2016. Uh, this is Metcalf Rising Park, 34th and Center. You can see the before in the uh, lower right. Uh, the residents in the design stage, they've shown movies here on nice summer days. And very simply, they wanted a wonderful area to show movies in the summer and for kids to play. And since it's on a major commercial corridor, uh, make sure that balls and kids don't run out in the street. So along with UWM Community Design Solutions, that is the space that they designed and we built for them. Um, MLK Peace Park is right across from Heartlove on the 3200 block of MLK. Um, this is a wonderful project between a local rapper, community ac activist named Fidel Verdon, um, MSOE, and Heartlove uh, Place across the street. What you see here is phase one of a true wonderful um, placemaking opportunity that's gonna happen. This site is gonna be activated with a stage it's going to have um, shipping containers that have been converted into IDEA labs. It's already got a ma major art installation honoring civil rights leaders from the 60s. It has fruit trees. It's going to have raspberries and, um, and raised bed gardening as well as we head into phase two. In terms of placemaking, we spent a lot of time making the places, um, especially in 2015, but as we go into activation, we've really had some wonderful things happen in the interim. Um, at two of the parks, we had a pumpkin giveaway in conjunction with Outpost, another great partner of, of ours. And at two parks, um, we had the mayor and Alderman Stamper. Uh, and actually, it was a, a pop-up. Folks didn't really know it was happening. Uh, we had a kind of a surprise pumpkin giveaway. We've tried to build in um, wonderful features into many of our parks. Um, the power of 10, they say you need 10 cool things going on at a site to make it a real viable site. We've been trying to honor that. Uh, we've had a number of community celebrations on the lower left. That's a uh, celebration of the orchard opening we had at the set orchard. Um, the young woman in the bottom middle she and her twin sister wrote a poem about how wonderful it was to have um, fruit trees in their new brand new orchard. And in the bottom right, 
Uh, we've had done community planning days as well. Um, the organizations that we've partnered with have been true partners, and, um, and in, order to, in order to establish a sense of place, we've, um, we've gotten them actively involved, not only in the design, but to the extent possible in the construction. So very simply, um, that is what we've been trying to do from a placemaking aspect, um, not only bring arts and culture, but really just try to create health, safe, green, sustainable spaces on the north side of Milwaukee with all the ancillary benefits of increasing property values and, and lower city expenses. So thank you very much. <laughs>
two vacant lots. You look in Harambe, you're talking about maybe 60 to 70 vacant lots. So we know a lot of them we want to save for some future new housing um, that will be developed. So when there's opportunity for a neighborhood and neighborhood to say, okay, this is the way we think we can engage in other, other residents to deal with some of the issues, then let's start talking about how we turn this vacant lot into land that um, the residents and businesses can make use of. So as we move forward, not only along the vacant lots, but we have a long trail area that we need to really develop and activate. So there may be opportunities for tree planting, for gardens, things of that nature also. Yeah, the, um, on this last slide, the upper left park is, is a joint homegrown river works park at 2nd and Vienna. And it's very close to the trail. I think we're, do we have time for one more? Okay. One more. Uh, he lives in the uh, the Water Tower neighborhood near Our Park and, and Lake Park, and and mentioned that it's, it's one of the more affluent neighborhoods. And his question was, what could his neighborhood help homegrown with? And there's m multiple opportunities for uh, sponsorship of future parks, underwriting of future parks. Uh, we are, in 2016, we're going to move a little bit from the residential neighborhoods to the commercial sectors um if if you've driven the streets you, you know that th that the commercial corridors of north avenue locust burley center um need some attention and this year homegrown is going to be focusing on north avenue from fourth street out to 20th street and um there are a number of sp uh, city sites that are on there and we would look for sponsorship help for creating those sites or any um, future parks. I don't, I'm sure that we haven't done our, our last Gillespie scale park, which, which was a significant um, park in terms of investment. Um, just lastly, as kind of a bragging point, so the, the parks you see on this slide right now are, are six major parks. All those came in at about under $20,000. Okay, let's have a hand for our <laughs> speakers today. production.